On this episode, Frank Blake stops by. Hey everybody, this is Gary Vaynerchuk and this is episode 285 of the Ask Gary V Show. And this feels good. I just said to the team yesterday, it's time to do more Ask Gary V shows. It is the rebirth of my content on the internet after a long lapse of Wine Library TV. It was Ask Gary V that started all. Andy, I don't know if you remember that. Were you an intern, Andy, at the time? Were you even here when Ask Gary V started? Of course I was here. I was here it was Stun. I, I know you were here before D Rock, but it was Stun Win. Oh, well, actually, if you're. Right, that makes sense. Respect. But what were you, like, officially? I'd, you were like a Calvin, right? <laughs> I'd become a full time employee. Okay, got it. Congratulations. I don't know. D Rock never met intern. Yeah, D Rock was. Did we have D Rock just work for free? He made clouds and dirt. I know he did, which is very ironic. Frank, I'm so happy you're here. Um, you know, a, a lot of what I've been talking about on my show, and I'll let you introduce yourself in a second, has been modern day marketing, influencers, a lot of people emerging. I have a lot of passion for two things. One, I want to start making a lot more LinkedIn content. Um, I went on a business trip to Chicago the other day and it was just really interesting how much I think I almost miss what I would call the 40 to 60 and 80 year old business conversations that I actually spend most of my time on. I think in general, uh, a lot of people have lost their way in tried and true business practices in today's modern world. And, and when, when I saw your email in my inbox, I immediately was like, let's get this going, let's get this on the podcast. I think this is gonna bring tremendous value to many different audiences, and so thank you for coming up here. Uh, I know you're flying in and out from Atlanta. For the people who are watching or listening, please tell everybody uh, who you are and a little bit of your origin story. Okay, uh, first, it's, it's a real privilege to be here. Thanks, Gary, and I love your podcast, and I love the energy you bring. I, it's just phenomenal. Thank so you. I'm How did you stumble on it? Uh, Do you know? That's a good question. Uh, it's a referral from a friend. That's awesome. Right? So Love it. Word of mouth. You, you, word of mouth and, and a long reach. Love it. Go uh, ahead. My background is uh, most recently I was the CEO of the Home Depot. I, I stepped down in uh, 2015. Uh, before that, uh, I worked at GE for a while, uh, ending up as a direct report to Jack Welch doing all the M&A activity for GE. I was... Uh, I'm a lawyer by training, which is kind of unusual, and uh, worked in and out of government, worked for President Reagan and President Bush, uh, both son and dad. And wow. so uh, very, very different. Where'd you grow up? I grew up in uh, Boston, Massachusetts, and then Are traveled Are you a Patriots fan? So sadly, so I, so I no, wondered, this is actually, I I wondered think... whether to respond <laughs> affirmatively to that, given that I listened to your show, and yes, I am a rabid Patriots fan, and remember, you know, way back in the day, Boston, Boston, yeah. it was the Boston Patriots. That's right. I actually, to show how old I am, I grew up rooting for the New York Giants because we didn't have a football. That's right. You were there was no there was NFL nothing, as we know it. It was no the first NFL, NFL before right. the merger. Exactly right. Exactly right. But yes, I love the Patriots. So, so I'm a big fan. Real quick, just to clarify this: if you are older than forty and a Patriots fan, it's amazing how much less venom I have for you <laughs> because you lived, we went through hard times. Because you times. went through real hard stuff. Times. If yeah. you're an under thirty year old Boston sports fan. Yeah. You are so privileged and so entitled that I have no respect for you in sports. In general, I love this. No, there's no the sense city. of entitlement. That got worn off. Same with the Red Sox Did fans. the 86 it, World, you know, you were a grown man in 86 yeah, World Series. Yeah. How, how old are you now? I'm uh, going to be 69 Love it. in a few days. So what? Wait, what are we talking about? 30? Uh, 20? What is it? Uh, I was around was, in 86. Oh, no, no, I know that. I'm trying to think about, where were you? In, were you at GE? Uh, no, I was in Washington D.C. I see. Did that just completely break your soul? I, it was or were you crushing. not a? No, I, it was crushing. For the kids it in here crushing. and the ones that listen, I just want to quit. I don't know. I just told my son this story. I don't know why I'm in the mood to bring this up. It's just so that game is crazy. Yes. Two outs. Yes. Nobody on. World Series. Yeah. The got Shea Stadium, the Mets Stadium said, "Congratulations, Boston Red Sox, 1986 World Champions." Two outs. And yeah. do you know this, Andy? Andy, two outs, nobody on. Red Sox were winning by one at that point, yep. right? Yep. Uh, you know the Bill Buckner poor, play? Poor Bill Buckner. But, like, but mean, there was so much happened before right. that. Thank you. That's exactly right. And, I you mean, know, and, you and went back to, And by the way, so 
to your point, Paul, poor Buckner, it's, it's unbelievable because he had such a real good baseball career. Yeah, he was exactly like a real right. player. He was a real player. Like a real good yep. player. You said all that happened before that was all the good things that he had done. No, no. That we, and the career. We're talking about like the multiple base hits, the wild right. pitch. Yep. There was yep. a wild pitch before. Yep. Like, exactly. There, it, it's way beyond that. Pinning it all on him was not, not fair. But there you go. That's it's Okay, it's, so let's let's move on. So you like grew up in Boston. like the kicks in the World Cup. And, and, and you grew up in Boston. What kind of kid were you? Oh, what kind of kid? I, uh, were you a good re- student? Uh, reverse if, of your instance, yeah. I worried about everything. Uh, Interesting. So major warrior. Yes. And retain that through the rest of my life. You know what's warrior. funny about that? I actually love that you just went there. One of the things that I have to do a better job of, or something that I believe in tremendously that I'm trying to communicate more, is there's two very opposite ways to win, and I really think they're yep. me and you, right? Yep. Like, like you know, it, it's, it's the 85 Bears who beat your <laughs> beloved Patriots by a <laughs> quadrillion. This is harsh. Which is, <laughs> listen, is very tough. it's not that harsh. Yeah, You've won yeah, a lot of yeah, Super Bowls. Sure it's way more harsh true, for me. I haven't even enough. been to one. Um, you know, 85 Bears, right? When I hear Warrior or, you know, Lawyer by trade, like, that's good because that's an extreme version of yeah. a defense that leads to offense. Yeah. And what I am is like the Loyola Marymount, like, College team from the late '80s, early '90s that was winning were winning basketball games, 157 to 139. Yep. You know. Um, but one of the things please, I learned, please, as when when I became the CEO of the Home Depot, which was a very un, unexpected turn of events. But when I became CEO, one of the great phrases that stuck in my head was Colin Powell's "Optimism is a force multiplier." Yes. And you learn that as a leader. Yes. That it's one thing to be worrying in your office, and you know, uh-huh. here's what could go wrong. But externally, it is optimism. And that's what drives the organization, is here's the vision of the future, this is the vision we're marching towards, and you have to be optimistic. Fred, let me ask you a question. As somebody who's consumed this content, and who, uh, actually, you know what, before I go there, talk to me about the unexpected turn of events. I, I'd love to know the story, you know? Home Depot's super iconic business. Do you obviously, that means, does that mean, how, how long were you at Home Depot before that? So I was at Home Depot five years before that, uh, and then I was the CEO for eight years. Understood, uh, and yeah. so, that's incredible. I, I, I came from GE, uh, I came, I had done M&A activity at GE, I then did the same for Home Depot and some other things. Uh, I tell the story, and it happens to be true, that uh, the nanosecond before the board called me and asked me to be the CEO, they uh, parted ways with my predecessor, I had no thought that I'd be the CEO. Wasn't it was planning, that left field. Wasn't planning on it, not strategizing, here's what I'd right. do if you, I were running You weren't this. doing the corporate ambition nope. strategy nope. thing nope. to nope. get it? Nope. I didn't even, a, ooh, that was interesting what you were about to say. Didn't even like have like fishing one day. Nope. You're like, well, if I was the CEO, right. I would. Not even driving dark on rainy Andy night, does that here's, every day what, here's what I'd do. And yeah. that's what happened. Yep. And so, so partly as a consequence of that, uh, it was, I thought long and hard about leadership, what leadership means, what it means to. Uh, take an organization at the time, Home Depot had about 350,000 associates, now it's got uh, over 400,000, but leading in a real organization of scale. Yes. And how That's you incredible. That. Yeah. Um, but anyway, back to the basic concept, while I'm a warrior, I believe that you need optimism. You actually, I totally and understand. probably you need both, and probably as much as you say you're an optimist, you actually oh, are I play, looking around oh. corners and thinking That's about- That's exactly right. right. Like, right. first of all, I surround myself with defense, Right. And defense comes natural to me because I'm an immigrant. My dad was pure defense. Right. So I watched an operator right. be defense. Right. Um, he was great at it. I mean, he's still great at it. Um, well, what you can't you, be please. in retail without worrying a little no. bit. Every day I mean, you're taking on so much day. risk. Yeah. You right. know, like, what's really tough about the liquor business is uh, that what Home Depot's advantage and other retailers have that we didn't is that because of prohibition, liquor in America became state regulated, yep. which meant that you could only buy from specific wholesalers, which eliminated any of your leverage. You know, we didn't have trade dollars. We didn't have all these great yeah. things yeah, that yeah, yeah. are profit yeah. centers for retailers. Yeah. Um, what are you up to now? So uh, since retiring from Home Depot, I'm on some public company boards. I'm the non-executive chair of Delta Airlines. Very nice. Um, I'm on the board of Procter & Gamble and on the board of Macy's uh, here in New York. How? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Uh, I do some uh, nonprofit boards, and then, and part of what has me so fascinated about the podcast world is producing a podcast uh, called Crazy Good Turns, where we take people who do exceptionally kind things for other people and just highlight And when did you for, start that? We started two years ago. And who's we? Uh, so the person I'm, I'm doing it with, his name is Brad Shaw, and he worked at Home Depot while I was there. And, and was are in you charge the host of, of the show? No. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> so, so no, I, I produce is a fancy word for saying I pay for it. I understand. Yeah. <laughs> That's, I love yeah, it. I'm looking forward yeah, to checking it out. Yeah. Well, let me ask you a question. From your perspective, from your long, gifted career, what's the number one mistake? And now sitting on these boards, and I, you know, I don't, you know, it sounds like you've consumed my content, but I'm trying to think about where I talk. You know, I don't go unbelievably deep into my un, my passionate point of view of how vulnerable the Fortune 5000 are in today's ever-changing environment. You know, what, what do you believe at this moment is the biggest mistake uh, senior executives, C-suite, uh, or the influencers of the C-suite of Fortune 500 companies are? What, when I say that, what pops to mind first? Uh, the first thing that pops to mind is the great organizations, I believe, great organizations become great organizations because they're focused on their customer and they are the best at answering a particular customer problem, solving a particular Product customer problem, whatever fit, it is. Right? As they get more successful and add people and add organizational structure, there's like uh, some law of business physics that they start getting much more interested in the organization. Itself. And it, itself. And what's good, They go from offense to defense. And what's good for the organization. So- AKA, the short-term profit margin of the organization? Or AKA, more often, AKA, I'd like my function to be bigger next year than it was this year. The executives within them, right? The, the, the guy all or the through, gal running? All through the leadership, from the senior leadership to the middle management. If you ask me, I mean, it's a fascinating thing when you look at incentives and how corporations run. We try to incentivize people for the whole business through stock options and the like. But I honestly think a lot of people, if you gave them the choice, which is our stock could go up or you could have a third more people reporting to you next year than you do this year, they'd choose the latter. Because you believe, and I agree with you, that ego is grossly underestimated in the halls yep. of the business world. Yep, yep, and, and it's really easy to lose sight of the customer. It's just so easy to get absorbed in your own problems rather than your customers' problems. And you see it every day I in see businesses. It. I and see it's it. why you know, innovative new companies win. steal a march of course. and they win. Because they come in religious about the exactly. problem of the moment. Exactly, exactly. Andy, give us the first question. Because I, I, I was feeling myself about to get into a 40 minute rant <laughs> with Frank and I was like, you know what, let me break this up otherwise I'll ruin the show. Question is from Brian Jackson. Brian Jackson. Yes. From where? Or you don't know? Uh, no. <clears throat> sure. He is from Greater Atlanta area. Right. Okay. He's Brian Jackson. Insurance. Okay. He asks, what are the key differences that Frank sees between the corporate executive world and the entrepreneurship world? And Frank, before you answer that, how much time do you spend or have you spent in the entrepreneurial landscape? Oh, a fraction compared yeah. to, I mean, I have spent most, I mean, I, I started in an entrepreneurial world Environment, yep. as a, in a law Lawyer, firm. Of course. I started my own law firm with a group of friends. Love that. Uh, but the bulk of my career has been sure. with, with the corporate world. I think the, uh, the big difference entrepreneurially versus uh, the corporate perspective is that at least for me, yeah, it please. was One man's point of view. Uh, the energy. Yes. So I believe regardless of where you are, large bureaucracy or an entrepreneurial world, you have to radiate out and have a lot of energy. You can survive in the corporate world without that. You, in my, from what I've observed, you can't survive in the entrepreneurial world without that. 
Uh, there's just the headwinds. And, and by the way, by the way, I think you know to that observation. I think the reason you can survive in the corporate world is you're starting at such a big base. Exactly. You're actually declining just as much as the yeah. entrepreneur. But yeah. when you start with a thousand pedals, yep. you know, versus four, yeah. when you lose four pedals, you're out. Whereas the corporation still has 996. Exactly right. I think that you know it's funny. You led me to something that I've been thinking a lot about recently, which is nothing stands still yet. My observation of the Fortune 1000 is that they think it's actually still when what's actually happening is it's declining, they just can't see it. There are many sweaters that they wear that mask the outside temperature and yeah. they can stay warm even when it's getting very cold outside. So that's the biggest difference because as an entrepreneur, if it's freezing outside, you know it's freezing outside and you do whatever the hell you need to do to get out of the sticks and light a fire. Where, where, and the company is yeah, not ahead. necessarily. Frank, where, where do you sit with technology? Like how teched out or not teched out are you? Like are you addicted to your phone? Do you, you know, do you, do you, are you mainly a Netflix watcher? Like, So mainly a me. Netflix watcher. Uh, Personally, uh, I don't know. I, I don't know where you'd put me in a one to ten scale of adaptation mm -hmm. to new technologies. What I can tell you from a business perspective is that you see everything in the world impacted by the new technologies and the new capabilities. You think about the Home Depot kind of world, building materials you wouldn't think of as, wow, this is going to be massive. Disrupted. And yet, it's, you know, just consider the humble light bulb and what's happened to the light bulb and the amount of intelligence that's now in a light bulb. I believe, personally, yep. a decade from now, uh, you know, this trough or overhead, people will kind of look at that the way we look at Couldn't gas lamp more. lit Couldn't streets. Oh, isn't that quaint? They had to put this in a trough or that's instead exactly of embedded, right. embedding the chips in 1, the One thousand percent. Yeah. So. What about personally? Uh, so personally, I've, I've watch Netflix, I, I'm... What are you I, watching? Uh, so I'm peculiar on that. I watch foreign TV shows. So Interesting. And Swedish and Norwegian and Danish foreign TV shows. So I that's love that. Just, yeah. Yeah, that's your yeah, style. Yeah. That's yeah. the beauty of Netflix. Yeah, that's the beauty of Netflix. I love and that. A lot of, lot of, and what about email, texting, social media? Where are you at with that? Uh, so <clears> social <throat> media, when I was the CEO of Home Depot, I did a lot on Twitter. I'm yep. a deep believer in... Uh, the power of those media to say thank you to people. In fact, one of the things we're doing on Crazy Good Turns is starting a, in fact, we're launching it with this show, hashtag Grateful Graham. Of Grateful just, Graham. Just taking the time to say thank you for peop to people who've done extraordinary things. Do you, Frank, it's interesting you're saying this. I'm, on a, I'm a big believer that negativity right now is dramatically right. louder than positivity. Right. Do you feel that is true, do you feel a sense of responsibility? Do you feel that people who are happy and positive have some sort of like sense of responsibility? To sh do you feel like it's an interesting human element? Like what's your take on positivity versus negativity, optimism versus, you so, know? So here, my, I got lots of takes on this and it is, and it is a- <laughs> Hot takes it, with Frank. And it is, a, it is a passion because in leading an organization of 350,000 people- Which is the, absurd. The most, and he's pissed about the 20 he's got. The most significant uh, tool, in a way, of moving an organization is with positive recognition and celebration. People understand that in a way that they don't understand anything else. So if you give them a story about here's what success looks like, they can actually relate to that, where you know memos that come from the corner office, everybody goes, who gives a shit? Nobody's I mean, reading them. Right, nobody reads them. But it's, it's the amount of money being spent in Fortune 500 land right now right. on information in PDF and memo form that can, gets consumed by no one is staggering. Staggering, staggering. And my, and so particularly starting as, a, as the leader of a company where no one knew who the hell I was, one of the things because I, you were even though you were there you were so not i i was, you weren't personally branding i was the organization was no one knew who people I was. were like what the Honestly, fuck right who is this guy what about the street what did the street do? yeah who is this guy no same you, thing wait same, real same. quick did you love that tell the you, truth no you were worried about it oh no no absolutely yeah absolutely so you, no, didn't, ta fact, you didn't take my, the point of view of like cool i'm underestimated i'm gonna rise like a phoenix and stick it to everyone you took the 
okay, I have 400,000 people. I have to get them to know who I am quickly, otherwise I'll be in trouble here. So, so my response to the board when they first called was- Are you, you out of your mind? I said, you need to take a day and think about this. You need to hire somebody who's actually understands retail much better than I do. And fortunately, and I need. Who to was think the about force of the? Do, do you have a sense of who the force was on at, the board? That, oh, sure, our lead director Ken Langone. I know Kenny. He is a force of nature. He's if a, you live here I in mean, New I, York. I, yeah, I mean, like there was no shot that that right. wasn't the answer. I mean, yeah. I set that up for myself. Yeah. My father-in-law the other day was reading his book. Oh, I love capitalism. And he awesome. literally like looks at me like. 50 pages in, he's like, this is your book. Yeah, it's awesome. It was it's funny, a- the first time I met Ken in his office, all we talked about was that the fact that both of us sold flowers by ripping it out of the ground <laughs> as five-year-olds. That was our kinship yeah, immediately. Yeah. yeah, Ken is one of the, I, first off, he's he is one of the most generous people I have ever period. met. Period. Because he cares about legacy. And, and he cares about people. That's right. So walking, when you love people, it's easy. He loves people. And walking a Home Depot store with him was one of the great treats in life because every single associate, he would put his arm around and really you'd feel that connection yeah. with, with the associate. Yeah. So it was really Ken was the moving force Make, behind It makes that. sense. But in any event, so my, <clears throat> my, my theory on recognition and thanking people on the business side, I think there are lots of other sure. aspects to it, is if... Uh, or a Twitter photo or something like that, which I would do whenever I was in stores, is, gee, if, if I, as the CEO, do this and send you a note or send, you know, we take a photograph together, first I'm recognizing you and specific yes. about what you're doing well, but also you now have some self-interest in my being famous. So you know this from selling baseball cards, yep. right? If I've got the signed baseball card of whoever it is, yep. you know, Carl Yastrzemski, I'd like <laughs> him to do well because that card I've will be more valuable, right? Of so if I, if, if I- I basically willed Kenny Lofton's <laughs> career into existence. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Kenny, <laughs> you know? There you go, where well, you yep. get the basic principle. I totally, That's totally understand. Yeah. But I do think that there's too much negativity. I think that there is uh, so much psychic return from being grateful and saying thank you to people. Do you believe people find what they're looking for? Yes. Me too. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think this is what we're yeah. talking about. Yeah, absolutely. I'm fascinated by this. Like in everything there's good and bad and like which one do you want to see? Yeah, exactly right. It's exactly the class. Right. It's yeah. very very interesting. Yeah. Well, uh I love competition, sports and everything. Yeah. You know, when you were, you know, let's talk about the last year or last two years of being the CEO of Home Depot. You know, how did you how did you view competition? Who did you feel was a threat? Was it was it a, a secondary player like a Lowe's or thing of that nature? <laughs> thank, thank you for that description. That's the truth. Yeah, yeah. Uh, was it the emerging beast of an Amazon? It was, was it absolutely Amazon? <clears throat> so and does without, that continue to be the case? Absolutely. Yeah, because absolutely. I see it. Yeah, you know, I've been meeting. I've been, you know, it's interesting. I had a phone call the other day with a company where they were like. We're in trouble. All our business is being done at Home Depot. They've been great to us, but they right and this was a very smart yeah, businessman. Yeah. They're like rightfully so. They're going to private label. Yeah. They need their margin. Um, you know, and weird. I've listened to three or four of your videos, and I just started. Just and this is a big company. It's not yeah. like a kid with like right. you know six jars of jam. And he's like, <laughs> we're doing Amazon now, and this is actually good. And I was like, wow. And then I started asking questions. I'm like. He and the organization is probably a 1.7 on the 10 execution on Amazon. Right. And they're already like, oh my God, this is the golden goose. And I'm like, wow, there's an 8.3 delta there. Wait till they actually understand what the hell this is. Yeah. It, not knowing the company, but it should be the case that that's a great time for Home Depot or any other retailer to have the discussion with that vendor on your future is better with us. And here's why your future is better with us, and here's how we'll make your future better. Well, you know with what's us. interesting? The inevitable channel conflict between retail. I mean, let's talk about Procter as a whole. Let's use Johnson Johnson. You know, yeah. Libra, obviously, right. I don't want to put you to right. like that world. The inevitable channel conflict between them and Walmart and Target itself, while all the startups go direct to consumer in this new environment, is going to be one of the most fascinating business debates and battles of the last 200 years. Yep. I, 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 I'm so fat, like I wish I was like a Canaletta and wrote books like this, I'd start now. The great channel conflict wars 
it's just going to play out. Well, it's a cha- it's the issues of channel conflict, the premium on innovation and focus on the customer. Yeah, but you know what's so interesting about that? And definitely the focus on the customer. That's all. Right. By the way, the attention of the customer is my religion. Yeah. It's all I got. Yeah. But yeah. back to the first one, I will tell you one of the things that I absolutely believe is a vulnerability of the biggest companies in the world, which is they overestimate their internal R&D at times because they're spending so much on it. The problem is sometimes the other person, Andy K, may not care that his shave is now one one hundredth of an inch closer even though Gillette spent $87 million it's, on it. Again, not to get into but it's obviously a value question. That's and right. Are you, is your innovation bringing you bringing the consumer the value? And I think that's right. And I think unfortunately, people look at you know these big companies who I'm desperate to help as well. They look at how much they're spending on R and D versus the reality of the value prop to the consumer. Yeah, whole another topic. Whole whole another topic that we could go for hours on, which is how do large companies innovate? How do they think about innovation? Yeah, it's, it's LinkedIn. And it's going to be a big. Do you use LinkedIn? Topic. I do. Do you consume content on LinkedIn? Uh, or do you use it more to reach out or answer email or like how do you use LinkedIn? So I it's I use I use LinkedIn frankly much more passively. Yes. Um, so What do you use it for if anything? Searching you, for you, people that I want to contact or people who contact me yeah. uh, because it's a you know, How often will you look at look at LinkedIn? Once a week, once a day? Uh, once a week. Once a week. Once a week. What about email? Yeah. All day? Email, email. I try to discipline myself and not spend too much time on it, but yeah, I'll certainly in the morning, I, early in the morning and at the end of the day, try to deal with emails. Andy, question. This is a little bit of a long winded question. No worries. Dave, uh, mentioned in person. Should we give Dave. Andy the mic, maybe? Yeah, Andy, Dave. grab the mic for him. Dave Kletch in Albuquerque, entrepreneur. Enterprise Sales Director at CenturyLink. I worked at HD back when Bob Nardelli took over and brought in people into what they called the SLP program. Bob came in during a time of transition and change was not as widely accepted as had been hoped. Frank came in and took over and was able to turn things around and increase shareholder value when Bob resigned. My question would be how? What did he see that Bob was missing that enabled him to drastically change the culture? They both worked at GE. Frank worked at HD under Bob, and when Bob resigned, Frank took over. Frank was able to change one of the change the culture of one of the largest corporations today. I had the pleasure of meeting Frank when I worked in Atlanta at HD Corporate in 2002, and I'm just amazed by what he was able to do after seeing behind the curtain the many issues HD had. That's incredible. That's nice to hear. Yeah, that's that's great. What's What's his name? Like, What's his name again? Dave Clutch. Let's, let's, Dave. Yeah, fix it. All right, Dave. I got to get out to Albuquerque. Uh, <laughs> what was the, you know instead of worrying about what Bob or this you yeah. know obviously keeping right. you know obviously having a sense of you classy gentleman like right. what was the what was the you you walk in how long did it take you to assess the situation well, how much time did because you were in it did it take less or you know, do you th- do you think that people are unbelievably naive of what happens when they're the last line of defense? Did you all of a sudden look at everything, and it, it, it was from a different angle? Like, I'd love to understand so, that. So, so Dave will appreciate this because uh, the SLP program that he references, my son actually uh, started working at Home Depot, and it was called the Store Leadership Program. In my son's case, and I don't know if this was true for Dave, uh, my son uh, returned from Iraq. It was a Iraq a war veteran, Incredible. and Thank you. the company made opportunities to come and work at a store. Yes, and he worked his way up from assistant store manager to store manager, and now he and he still works at the company at a different job. Interesting. So part of the answer to how did I know, or how did I develop a point of view on what needed to be fixed was you had somebody in the trenches exactly, I, <laughs> and I had somebody in the trenches who. So the problem again with large companies actually companies any size is the the leaders are the frog that the company boils so gradually everybody molds themselves to what they think you as the leader wants to the hear end. and you stop hearing what you need to hear and people just know that it's in their self-interest. If you say how are things going, it's in their self-interest to say, Gary, they're going great. You're awesome. Please go. I mean, they just. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. And anyway, really, so my son no, no, would really, tell me I what was actually going. I apologize to interrupt, but I have to ask you this in question. Yeah. 
because boy, do I like a lot of things coming out of your mouth. I'm starting to really understand why you like <laughs> my content. Yeah. Um, reviews. What do you think about reviews? You mean on, on the internet? No, I mean a company reviewing its own employees and the process of. Oh, wow. All right, so that's a whole nother, that's, that's a whole nother discussion. Um, Your quick hot takes on reviews. So quick well. hot takes yeah. is, is uh, honestly, I didn't do what's called 360 reviews because, because I think that they're the uh, bullshit. Yeah. They're bullshit because they're no different than what you were just saying before. Which I, is the humans that are reviewing the humans have their own self-interest in mind in the review. Thank you. Exactly right. This is, you know, honestly, because exactly. I'm going to use a lot of this content for LinkedIn, you and I right now, and I'm not kidding, this is how I think about the new world of distribution, could literally right now make a video clip and have an article accompanied by that that should completely take over all of LinkedIn. The number one conversation that companies need to start having is reviews. Right. Because it is fundamentally broken at a level that isn't even remotely close to servicing the organization and more importantly, the people within it. Yep, I, I agree. I, I would also, I mean, and it starts at such a basic level. I mean, reviews is like the, is, is one of the things that's broken, but in most companies, most places, think about the basic things like when you promote someone. Does anyone explain why this person was promoted? so that everybody in the organization goes, oh, I understand why Joe or Jane got that promotion because they did A, B, C, D, and E. And that's what the business I is I love where you're for. going, I love where you're going. Talk to me about A, B, C, and D. In one man's point of view, just right. yours, how much of that needs to be black and white and how much of that needs to be gray? Right? It can be whatever it is. It can be, it can be all. That's, that's the DNA of the organization, right? Exactly, exactly. What people will conform to is what they see is required to, to advance. develop their own success. You know, you know, Frank, you like this. A lot of people ask me a lot of like why we were able to grow so quickly in the advertising world, especially by a founder who came from the liquor industry and it surprised a lot of people. It was because I was, because we were HR driven. The first five to seven years of this company was a, you, you were rewarded if you were an A person and a C, yeah. C executor. Now, I've also now started to change that because what got right, you there right, doesn't get right, you to the next right, place. Right. But you know, it's super interesting to me that people don't understand. The number one thing that bothers me right now, talking to senior leaders, especially if her title is CEO, is when they start complaining about their team, when I tell them, wait a minute, you're creating the incentive. Gary, this is, Frank, when I tell you this happens a million times a, a year for me. Gary, I agree with you, but my team, I can't get them <laughs> to spend more on Facebook. I go, right. Carol, you're I've got a big charge. idea. I got a big idea. Right. If you make their bonus predicated on them having to spend right. $1 million on Facebook ads per month, miraculously, <laughs> it's going to happen, Carol. Yep. I had a great I had a great activist investor on the Home Depot board. He was one of the best board members. He had a great phrase. He said it can be very hard to herd cats. Yep. But you can move their food. I, I couldn't <laughs> and, and I couldn't that's, agree and that's more. Pretty fundamental. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. So in any event, that's the you need not only on the HR reviews. Why are people getting promoted? Because otherwise, let's get a call they, from there. People on uh, uh, on Instagram, put up your phone numbers. We're gonna let one of you call in now. Uh, hand it over to Andy. You've been listening along. Ask away. Go ahead, Frank. I apologize. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I think that's right. Yeah. What, what was the thing? So you had people like whether it was so a Jack. I, so, so I had. And please. Yes, I had Jack. I uh, Jack was very gracious and. And you had uh, Langone and these people, yeah. but I want to ask a different question. You had when you. I mean, when you start with Langone and Jack, yeah, like yeah, who had it better right, than you, right? Yeah, kind of yeah, thing. Exactly right. What was the biggest thing that changed in the reality? You know, the big thing that I think people that have won historically struggle with is that things have changed since they were playing. I'll give you a good example. I am so fascinated about Coach Gruden with the Raiders. What he's doing in his free agency right now and what I think he's doing is building a team for an NFL that doesn't exist anymore. And I'm curious, if he's been out of the game, will he be successful? I think about Joe Gibbs coming back yeah, and yeah. not being successful. Yeah, yeah. What was the, pe from, you had all these icons, these mentors, you had your own career. Yeah. What ended up being not true 
that you know, over some dinners as you were being thoughtful and figuring out what was, what was because of the era you were playing in, maybe the internet age, maybe the way millennials were emerging, whatever it might be, what was the piece of advice or tried and true thing, what, something Colin Powell said in a book or something Kenny Langone said over breakfast or something that Jack Welch sent you a letter about that actually when played out was not as true as it might have been in 87, 78, 64. So I, rather than what they might have said, I'll give you what I thought the job was and what I learned it to be. What Please. I thought the job was, and somebody bra- very bravely came into my office about 60 days into being a CEO and just said, hey, you're really fucking this up, and here's why. <laughs> it's amazing. And, sorry, and, and the description was, he, he showed all these gears interconnected. He said, look what happens if the top gear is spinning madly, and I had, I had internalized the job of the CEO is I make decisions. I make fast decisions, I make good decisions, but that's my job, I make decisions. And this guy was very creative, put on this chart and he said, look at what happens, you get the top gear Spinning. spinning, and the gears at the bottom are just going out of control. He said, visualize your job. Your job is to feel when the smallest gear is moving. That's your job. Very good. And if you, and if you look, so I go, gosh, that's, that's a different way of looking at my job. I'm not going in my office. I'm not you know, sending out decisions. I am actually trying to spend more time figuring out what is moving on the smallest gears because those are the ones closest to the customer. I don't know that that's a, I think that was probably always true. Yeah. But there was some sense in which I definitely had it wrong. I had a wrong notion of how to do it and learn that love you that. gotta flip it upside down. I love that. Andy, you got a question? Not yet. Not yet, okay. Um, while Andy's pulling up the last question, what, um, I actually, this, is, this would be interesting to me now that I've got a sense of you. What, what, in your consumption of my content early on from that word of mouth, what, you know, in a world where you've read a lot of stuff, you know, you, you know, you're not on your first day here. Right. Like what, what even made you say, wait a minute, this, this guy's up to something? Uh, so a couple of things. Um, the first is energy level. So yeah. I am, I am a just, you believe in that. I'm a believer in energy and you know, you're period. Some, period. And I you're, agree. you're somebody who just, you can yep. feel the energy. The second is I'm a deep believer in the kind of, I call it the simplicity on the other side of complexity. So there are people who are simple, but it's simple. And just simple, simple isn't much value. But somebody who's actually processed stuff and can then say as you do, all right, here's this the word. It. You know, the word is don't be entitled or the word is attention. The ability to synthesize big data for information exactly. and it's, make it consumable to the end consumer. Yes. That's hugely powerful, yeah, hugely that's, powerful. That's right. Yeah. And you caught that quickly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> And I think that's why, I mean, that's why people want to listen. They want yeah. to go, God, this guy's getting input. It's how it's how I'm able to move right. people, organizations. Right. A- Andy, who are we calling? Samari Robinson. Samari? Hi. Samari? Holy cow, beautiful. Oh, you're through. Yep, you're through. You're here with me and Frank. Oh my gosh, I can't believe this just happened. <laughs> Holy what's, cow. What's your question? My Hello, friend? Mr. V. My question is, I want to affect the change in a large group of people towards God and I need to get their attention to do it. And how do I do it? One more time, say it a little slower. You're trying to do what? I want to affect a change in a large group of people towards God. And in what? Towards God. Oh good, very nice. You want to move a lot of people's attention towards God. Yes. Okay. I just want to, you know, be positive. Okay. And so they- Be helpful, you know, help the world. Okay, fair enough. So I think you know. I think when I'll I'll take a stab, and then Frank will jump in. I think one of the biggest mistakes, especially a a young person on their journey that wants to bring impact or or affect something, is they don't realize it's more about listening than talking. Right. Mm -hmm. So you know, for me, what has really worked is. You know, there's a lot of confusion to all my talking. I produce so much content. First of all, in the first, you know, 15 years of my career, I didn't say a word. You know, I did a lot of listening and watching. Right. And then, even now, I, cons- I read my comments more than I do anything else. So I think, first of mm-hmm. all, you need to deploy patience. How old are you? 
I'm 18. Right. So you need to realize that if you really want to impact the world, you'll probably start seeing dividends when you flip your numbers around and you're 81. Right? Mm. And when you're 18, that sounds absurd because that's like four lifetimes from now. But that is the reality, my friend. Like, like if you were calling our show right now and saying, I wanna change the world, I wanna bring impact, I wanna bring positivity, I wanna turn people towards God, that's amazing. I just need you to understand, that's not like saying I'm gonna walk five blocks. You're, you're trying to boil the ocean. You're, you're going for a big, big thing. And that needs, to be life's wor- that needs to be life's work. And if it's life's work, you need to be patient and realize that at 36, which is double your age now, you're a child. Frank laughs at 36 years old. That's a baby. <laughs> you know. And so I would say patience and listening are gonna be your two pillars. Frank? I, that's great. That's a great response. Uh, patience and listening. And uh, I think the, the, the modeling the behavior that you wanna see in others. Um, so. Set the example. Yeah, set, set the example. My friend, can I ask you a question? Yes, sir. Why? Well, I want to do it because I want to be helpful. I want to leave, leave a legacy when I die. You know? that, that's I, your selfishness is, because the selfishness is the key, right? To me, I'm always curious about one's selfishness when they're being selfless, right? Like for me, mm-hmm. I was so overloved by my mother I love the attention and the admiration, which is what I got my whole life, that it's obvious to me that I'm, that what I figured out subconsciously is that the only way to actually get that at massive scale is to do it for others, not for yourself, right? Do you, gotcha. you know, do you want a legacy because that then means fame and money? Do you want the statue? Want, do you want to prove something to your dad? Like, like for real, why, for real? I want it, when I do something good, when I, when I do something good, it feels good. That's good, man. I'm serious. I believe and you. It is selfish. I, I, I will, uh, it's selfish, but it feels good doing good things. And, you know, I'm not going to lie. When I, when I preach the Bible to people, or, you know, I'm annoying. With, I'm not annoying, but when, <laughs> I, like, when I preach the Bible to people and I, uh, you know, try to be positive and get people's attention and entertain people because I also make videos online right now. Yep. You know, it, it feels good. It feels good. Good, man. Helping people, and I want to be positive and get as much attention as possible. You know, I want to make movies. I want to build my own production studios and, you know, stuff like that. I'm, I want to be an actor, director, a whole bunch of stuff. Do you think, do you and think, do you, I feel do you like think, getting people's do you think, attention is the way to do that. Do you think in Tyler, change. do you think in Tyler Perry terms? Yeah. At yeah, some point, sense. I want to be at that point. Makes sense. I'm sick. Listen, that, that's my goal. Listen, let me give you uh, two more cents on a goal like this during a time like this. Spend all your time, one of the things, so my whole career I was innovating. I was doing things that hadn't been accepted yet. And the biggest piece mm-hmm. of advice that I give to people is spend no time on the people that are saying no, spend all your time on the people that are saying yes. And I think that my friends who are, selling the Bible or the Torah or the Haran, Taran, you know, like uh, to, to me, right? The Quran, excuse me, I was like, oh, you know, to me, they spending too much time on the people that are saying no. They get so passionate mm-hmm. in converting somebody versus realizing there are tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands or millions that are saying yes right in front of them, but they go on the defense of like converting somebody. And so I spit my truths about business and nobody listens at first because it doesn't have short-term ROI, mm-hmm. but over time it comes to me. I, I'm telling you right now, focus on the yeses, not converting the noes. Gotcha, gotcha. You got it, brother. Take care of Man, yourself. I love it, thank you guys so you much. You got it. Yeah, it's time to go, I know you have to go. Frank, you get to ask the question of the day. I know you just pointed, it's two and one, we're one minute <laughs> over. I apologize, but I'm really enjoying this. Every guest gets to ask the question of the day. Um, you've got, thousands of people listening, entrepreneurs, executives. Um, what would be a question, you know, this is a good opportunity for you to get some insights, maybe about the things you're up to with your podcast or just curiosities you have. The question of the day to the Vayner Nation. So my question of the day is um, asking folks, who, to whom do they have a sense of gratitude right now, I if it, it pops into their mind, to whom are, who are they grateful? grateful? And then the second question related to that is, go express it. I love go it. Go express it. I go love say, you for that. Go, go do that. This was unbelievable. You yeah. know, I'm, I'm getting 
80, 90 emails, 100 emails a week of like, I want to be in your podcast, your big podcast, you know, I want to be in the Ask Gary V show. We, we haven't done an Ask Gary V show in forever. It was so funny when yours came, you know, intuition's a funny thing. I'm glad, I'm glad yeah. we did this. Thank no, you this for being up terrific. here. Thank I you. appreciate having yeah. you.